Good morning, Great United Methodist Church at Hartwood. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Bible study portion of our service this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, in this glorious time of year, we pray that you would visit our hearts, visit our land. Heal us, Lord, from the inside out. And Lord, let your land be rejoicing once again. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I have uh, cracked open some scriptures for today's service that are not typically the kind of Sunday morning fodder that we use. And I'm, I'm going to skip over those for now and invite you to, to turn to Psalm 22. This is the only scripture that Christ quoted on the cross. And it begins, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? As you read through this psalm, it paints a picture of what Christ experienced on the cross. My bones are out of joint. My, I am surrounded by bulls of Bashan. I don't know what a bull of Bashan is. All I know is it don't sound good, right? It sounds, sounds like being surrounded by something rough. And uh, so I, I can tell you I'm, I'm a country boy, but I've fished a lot of farm ponds. And when bovines with stickers on their heads start chasing me, they're all bulls. I don't, I don't care what kind of equipment God outfitted them with. If they start chasing me and they've got stickers, they're bulls. <laughs> and uh, that clearly was what Christ was feeling around him as he quoted this psalm. The point is that there are lots of dark psalms that deal with the darkest moments of our lives. And we tend in church to skip over those. We tend in church to skip over and look for the, the happy-go-lucky psalms, the ones that, that lift our hearts. And, and why not? You know, why, why would you not want to, to move to the ones that lift us up? But the thing is, we all come to a place in our lives where we experience these dark hours. And knowing that there are psalms there that speak to this is an important way for us to be able to express what we're going through in a faithful way. The, uh, the psalm, if you, uh, if you read on in verse 19, it says, But you, O Lord, don't be far away. O my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Again, dogs were, were uh, a metaphor for those uh, oh, evil Gentile forces that were inhabiting the Holy Land. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of wild oxen. And suddenly there's a shift. From the horns of wild oxen, you have rescued me. If, if you've uh, studied much uh, medieval history, you might know that part of the reason Stonehenge was built was that it was a gathering place for the oryx. The oryx was a cow, but it was huge, it was wild, and it was mean. And pretty much, straight horn thing, right? right? Yeah, straight yeah. horn thing, kind of, kind of like Texas Longhorns, except instead of going out, they went forward. Uh, they were, they were uh, the size of a draft horse, oh. and so it wasn't something that you wanted to just have. Uh, but it was what they had available uh, in the boat 
bovine department back in, in England in those days. And apparently throughout the ancient world, there were remnants of these wild cattle that, that were not safe to be around. So, so the psalmist says, you delivered me from the horns of the oryx. I'll tell your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise. In other words, there's a sudden gear shift here. Now, there's a couple of possibilities about these psalms with the sudden gear shift. One is that the psalmist went back and finished the psalm after the days of darkness were completed, after the days of depression were over, after the crisis abated. The psalmist went back and said, okay, wait a minute. I'm going to finish what happens when you pray at a time of crisis. Another possibility, and you can really see this in some of, some of the psalms for help, is that somebody else went back and said, man, that's too dark to put in the Bible. i, I got to put something here that says, nevertheless, God answers our prayer. That's called redaction, where somebody who was actually putting the scriptures in the Bible adds a note, and over time it becomes part of scripture. Now, if you subscribe to the mechanical version of inspiration, here's what the mechanical version means. At some point in salvation history, God said to Moses or somebody, here, Sit down, write this, I've got something to tell you. Do you take shorthand? Because there's a lot we're going to cover. Uh, if, you, if you subscribe to the mechanical version of inspiration, then this is deeply troubling. My version of inspiration is that, yes, there was an original time when God whispered truth to someone and they wrote it down. But that doesn't mean that inspiration stops at that moment. And the full witness of inspiration unfolds over generation upon generation. We know that this happened because we have ancient versions of the Old Testament and New Testament. And in those ancient versions, there are fewer verses than there are in our modern translations. We, we know this because even in times where we don't have the ancient scripture itself, we have commentaries by the, the Jewish elders and by the church fathers, and in those days they were all guys, and the church fathers who were writing verse-by-verse -verse commentaries, and they skip over some of those happy verses and closures because they weren't there. And they are there in, in later versions that we have. Uh, again, if you believe that there was an inerrant version of the Bible that God dictated once, then this is deeply troubling. It's not something that troubles me. In fact, it encourages me. Because the whole point of the book of Psalms is that our prayers are also inspired scriptures. The book of Psalms is a collection of, of prayers. Most of them were done responsibly in the ancient temple and in the ancient uh, pre-temple gatherings. So that's why we still do responsive readings today because we've been doing this for oh, 5,000 years. And I've, I've studied enough anthropology to know that once you've got a tradition that's been around for 5,000 years, it's kind of important. And so you don't want to just chuck it and, and say, well, we're beyond that now. There's a timeless wisdom there that speaks to us. Uh, in any case, not only... <coughs> is the redactor's inspiration valid, but so is yours. Your prayers also reveal the word of God to all of us, and that's the witness of the book of Psalms. 
Now, the fact that there are many, many dark psalms that talk about our alienation, about God's alienation, like, where are you when I need you? Like, I thought you promised me you'd take care of me, and here I am, I'm in a mess, so what are you doing, Lord? What's up with this? The fact that those psalms are in your Bible means that when you feel that way, you are not being unfaithful. We have been unfaithful by not teaching you that it's in you. There are many scriptures that speak to our dark hours, but none more clearly than the Psalms. Now, let, let me pause here and say this. Um, there are different types of literature in your Bible. There's, uh, there, there's epic stories. There are prophetic utterances. There are poems, and psalms are almost all poetry. And I'm fully aware that for some people, poetry falls flat. It falls flat because some folks' minds just don't work this way. My Old Testament professor said the best way to describe poetry is to say, my love is like a red, red rose. Well, if you get too analytical about poetry, you ruin that. Because you start saying, well, what does that mean? Does that mean my, my love is thorny and makes my thumb bleed? Does that mean my love smells sweet right now, but in a couple of days it's going to be brown and stinky? The, the more you analyze that, the more you ruin it. Because poetry just means what it means. You can't analyze it or you kill it. So I'm fully aware that for some minds, the book of Psalms just leaves us flat. <laughs> but if you are of a mind where this poetry moves your soul, then the Psalms are the high watermark of the Old Testament for revealing God to us. And it's also the high watermark of us being given permission to be honest. One of the most beautiful of all psalms begins, By the waters of Babylon, there we hung up our lyres. For our captors there required of us psalms, saying, Sing us the songs of Zion. O Zion, how can I sing of thee in a strange land? And it goes on and it says, God bashed their baby's brains out. This is not something we quote in Bible school, right? It, it's not something that uh, you would accept your preacher saying as good theology. But here's what the psalmist understood. We all get so angry sometimes that we could just kill somebody. You've been that angry with your preacher a few times. And, and in church, we cover all that honesty up with the verily, verily God. We come to you and we beseech thee, thou most high. And nobody knows what you mean when you pray like that. Even God <laughs> Almighty says, what do you say? But when we are brutally honest, we carry our anger straight to the cross. And God is the only one who's big enough to take that anger. So we do it backwards a lot in church. What we do is, in church, we do the verily, verily, thou art ever verily, thou art God. And when we're talking to each other at lunch after church, we say, Oh, that Pastor Larry, sometimes I could just kill him. <laughs> well, there is nothing we can do for each other to heal that kind of hurt and anger. God is the only one who can handle it. God is pretty self-assured because nobody else is bucking for his job, right? 
Well, every now and then I have. Somewhere in my life, and this is another sermon for another day, I discovered two bits of good news that were equally powerful. The first good news, and I think I always knew this but didn't fully understand it, is there is a Savior. There is a Savior, one who can handle all of our anger, all of our hurt, all of our frustration. There is a Savior. Second bit of good news may be even better. It ain't me. So I, I cannot save you. I cannot lead you to victory. I, and I don't have to try. My job is to point at the one who can. And when the Psalms start out by the waters of Babylon and wind up, Lord, bash their heads against the rocks. The psalmist is pointing us to take our anger, our frustration, and our rage to the only one who's big enough to receive it, heal it, and do something with it. The psalmist didn't expect, by the way, for God to start bashing babies. The psalmist did expect for God to take that anger, frustration, and rage and begin to heal it. So, as people of faith, if you have never done so, I would encourage you to read the book of Psalms. There's roughly 150 of them. Okay, there's exactly 150 of them. Uh, that means you can read one a day for five months. It means you can read five a day for one month. It's an easy read. Some of them are longer than others. And you know, uh, when you get to the long ones, wh what they are, because they're that long because they're, they're alphabetical in the Hebrew alphabet. Kind of lost on us in translation. <coughs> but the, the Jewish elders used to say, if you don't know what else to say to God, pray the alphabet. Because all the words are there, and God will put them together the way they ought to be. So there are psalms that are really long because they, they go through every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, usually outlining a reason for the things or give praise for each letter. That's still a valid thing to do when you don't know how to pray with your children. Tell them, okay, today we're going through the alphabet. We're going to think of a reason to praise God for A, praise God for B, for N. And God will put all the letters together. Most of the Psalms are mercifully short. Fairly easy to remember, especially for those of us who were raised on the King James. The King James seems to be easier for us to remember. If you weren't raised on the King James then it's a tongue twister. But uh, I would encourage all people of faith to read through the Psalms. And I'd especially encourage you to put just a little bit of a highlight or something beside the dark ones. When you are in a time of the dark night of the soul, I, I give you permission I, I give you instruction to look for these shifts like I just talked about in Psalm 22 and draw a line between where you're at in that darkness and the light that's coming. Go ahead and write a date beside the part of the psalm that expresses the darkness and frustration you're feeling. And then you can always go back later and write a date beside the time when God answered and everything turned out bright and sunny and beautiful. You might even want to work, write the words, prophecy fulfilled. <laughs> well, I have droned on longer than I usually do without pausing for breath. Uh, 
What are your thoughts so far? Well, you touched on the whole thing about it's always like syrupy sweet. I mean, I think about you know the you're in church, you know, no 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 make it ain't made in there. But I like that movie, you know, Apostles, Robert Duvall, because you know, here's a guy, he's a religious guy, he, he kind of did a bad thing. Oh God, does that? Kind of. But but, <laughs> but but he's he's like you know he gets mad at God. He says, well, go ahead and get mad at God. I'm taking. You know, mm-hmm. he just wants that line of communication open. It's not always seriously sweet, or you know, you have to deal with people that are high and mighty or pure, but uh, they're real. I uh, I call it Ren and Stimpy theology. Happy, happy, joy, joy, happy, happy, joy. Oh, happy. <laughs> and it, it sells well. Um, you will you will note that uh, all of the mega church pastors on TV do Ren and Stimpy theology, and they make a lot more money than I do. <laughs> and they get they get a lot more hits on their videos every week than I do. Uh, by the way, I mentioned Ren and Stimpy theology in a church I was serving once, and a guy in in the congregation uh, had worked on the animation studio that does Ren and Stimpy. <laughs> so he got me actually a a. a, a a sketch by the Ren and Stimpy artist and he had it signed. No way. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, but I like uh, I like the theology and, and the Psalms and the autograph here a lot. <laughs> yes, Robert? I like verse 24. It was a, he's not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, not hidden in faith from him. It's like we, like, we want it, I mean, sometimes we, have, we see someone afflicted where we have a lot of compassion for the afflicted person, but like, their affliction is kind of like, oh, yeah, I mean, you're depressed. So that's the yeah, idea. I was like, I'm depressed. That's ah, oh, gross. It's like, I don't want to hear about that. It's like, God does not despise or abhor the affliction itself. He's, he's right on that. He's right there. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, the truth is, uh, until. My wife and I walked this path of affliction through her stage four melanoma. I was unaware how much of a jerk I was, and and how automatically when somebody was suffering, I thought of a reason for that. <laughs> like, oh well, yeah, they're they're suffering, but they used to smoke. Oh well, yeah, he's suffering from pancreatic but he used to drink. Oh yeah, well they're they're getting divorced, but he was never home. Uh, you know, there's always a reason, always an explanation why the afflicted are being afflicted. And to actually enter into that that point where you care for the afflicted without judgment, you have to walk that valley yourself before you can get there. I think. Anybody else? Yeah, Mike. This is not going to surprise Carlene, and I may mean, not surprise him, but I'm, I'm not a big reader. Um, I, I feel like I've probably missed out on a lot of the treasures of the world without having left my, my house. But the one thing that, that my Christian walk has done for me, especially when it comes to reading the Bible and Scripture, is by taking disciple one, I read the Bible. Or at least I read the required parts of the Bible. <laughs> and when when it took when I was leaving adult Sunday school, I had I had to read scripture for that as part of the lesson. But one thing that Bill Swears uh, always talked about was the 91st Psalm. Excuse me. He said the 93rd Psalm. And he talked about when he was in Vietnam, how his mother read it every night and found comfort. Well, my curiosity got the best of me, and I finally went to read the 93rd Psalm, and it's like, this doesn't match up with what he's saying it was. <laughs> so it turns out it was actually the 91st Psalm, and it's the same Psalm that, that uh, Jimmy Stewart uh, read and also passed out to all of his flight crew during World War II. Uh, and uh, there, there's a lot of comfort to that, but while I was looking around, I 
read the 94th Psalm. Mm -hmm. and, and that has stuck with me for years because the 94th Psalm talks about striking down the wicked and making things right uh, against the oppressors. And it just it gives me hope that for all the bad things that happen in the world, it's going to be good in the end. Because in verse 22 he says, But the Lord is my defense, and my God is my, the rock of my refuge. And he shall bring upon them their own inequity, and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. Now, some people might think, you know, hey, well, that's kind of violent, or, you know, you talk not like bashing babies in the head or anything. It's not that bad. <laughs> But I just find comfort because there just seems to be so many things that happen in the world and people get away with it. And I know we're a church, but that pisses me off. You know, it, it makes me upset. But, but I know in my heart of hearts, he's got it. Amen. Amen. That's a, a good way to sum it all up. We're going to take about a five-minute break. We'll start in with worship again in a few minutes. Thank you all for being here. And please visit the kitchen.
this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, your father and mother we know? How can we now say, I came down from heaven? Now, crumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus answered, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I gave up for the life of the world. Then they began to argue amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? On hearing it, then his disciples said, It's a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you also want to leave me? Testament reading today is from Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us then, nothing in his appearance that we should despise him. He was despised, as I remember him. He was despised and rejected by people a man of sorrow and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. We considered him punished by God, because he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed by our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We are, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. By arrest and judgment, he was taken away. Yet, of his generation, who protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any lie in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord may be an offer for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. After he has suffered, he will see the light of death, light of light. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquity. Therefore I give him a portion among the great, because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the guilty ones, for he bore the sin of many, and pleaded for the sons. ask you now to join me in prayer, please. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this beautiful day. And knowing you were always with us in times of sorrow and in times of happiness. This bright sun filled our day. Help us to remember that your grace and peace abide in our hearts. And always, even when we fail to live up to your words and examples, we often do. Our failures to be giving when we should be generous with our time, talent, and treasure. Our failures to be loving and charitable when we are not. Our failures to always follow your example. We thank you for forgiving our trespasses and continuing to send us your love and provide your teaching examples to us so that we continue to seek and become better Christians. To follow your teaching in our hearts and in our minds. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
I just wanted to let you guys know that I'm going to have the same last person come and speak on a Sunday so that we can all better be on the same page as to um, the scope of work and the need for the work. Um, and uh, prayers, good news and prayers that uh, with the funeral, I didn't have a single person say it smelled like junk in it. Other than the side door, but um, back to the to the stained glass, we were blessed with a, a significant um, contribution for, and thank you to everyone who has given um, with regard to the stained glass, and that covered um, us being able to secure all of the medals that would be required for the job in one lump sum, which saved us some money. Um, and some more good news is that this doesn't have to be done all at once. The, the windows are in the order of importance to, to start with the um, um, the altar um, window that's actually bowed and in real jeopardy. Um, but I, I would like to do the educational piece just so everyone can be on the same page as to whether it's a need or whether it's a want, um, number one. And then the, the second thing to consider that um, we've been praying on is just with regard to the annex and a place for the youth. Um, that's another big project. But um, I'm hoping, and I haven't talked to Pastor Larry um, this week, that, that, that Jesse could come next Sunday. And it, it's not a big presentation, but um, I'll have some marketing pieces to go along with uh, those. I understand there's been some um, curiosity for people who'd like to give that aren't even, uh, you know, don't come here every Sunday. So I'd like to have something to present to them um, if they feel the need. Okay. Yes. I'd like to lift lift up Linda Dietrich. She lost her husband Lee Friday morning from Alzheimer's. Okay. Okay. Any anybody suffering from that disease is uh, losing their life one inch at a time, and our hearts are with them and their family. Any others to lift up? Yes, Doctor. I'd like to thank Catherine for doing the prayers and squares and getting that off the ground. Um, there was a there yesterday, and it was wonderful. And if anybody knows of someone who could use a prayer quilt, uh, let us know, and we'll make sure that happens. It's going to take us a little bit of time because we're just getting started. But anybody who is interested, please come and join us. Um, the second and fourth Saturday of the month, uh, every month until May, 7th through May, and it, it starts at 9 o'clock. But it's a really, really good um, thing for us to be doing and a good project for everyone. Amen. Thank you for that. Uh, the emphasis is on prayer, so you don't have to be a quilter. Uh, the emphasis is, is on prayers and squares, so it helps if you're not a hipster. Yes. We're, um, I mean, Deborah, plan. we're not going to be here next Sunday. We're planning a trip. We've been doing this for a while. Um, we go out and have a reunion with some of our friends we were in mission with years okay. ago. Back as That'll be next weekend. And then we're going to spend a week in Seattle area with my dad. And we haven't been to his place for, I uh, since the kids were fairly little, you know, tiny, tiny. Um, but anyway, the prayer part is, is just that it's been a while since either of us have traveled much and uh, and our health is, we have various health things going on. We should be fine, but still it's like, I don't want anything to go wrong. <laughs> it messes up into the airports and cars and, and traveling around. So. Amen. Prayers for protection. Bring them back to you, Edom. Oh, you don't know what a good up is. You'll have to look it up. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. <laughs> Anyone else? Very good. Let's go to God together. Creator God, come and visit your people once again. Lord, as all creation shouts for joy, we hear your whispering voice among us. Lord, cause us to join that creation song, even as we anticipate winter's long sleep 
the cruel times of Sabbath rest and death, and the resurrection coming next spring. Lord, hear us as we call out to you those needs and names and voices that are most precious to our hearts today. Even so, Lord, come quickly and teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on our earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the scriptures we shared this morning probably are not any of them scriptures that you learned in Bible school. I'll bet you don't have any of them carved into a plaque and hanging on your wall at home. And they're not scriptures that just roll lightly off the tongue. Even our passage from the Gospel of John, which we read quite frequently as part of our communion litany, we don't read the whole thing. We stop short of where all of the disciples were falling away. Now, now this is at a point where... Jesus had uh, fed the multitudes, and throngs were following him, going, yeah, boy, free food. <laughs> the feeding the multitudes is the only miracle that's in all four Gospels. This is proof Jesus was a good Methodist. <laughs> that's what we do best, feeding the multitudes. What gets skipped over a whole lot is that after he fed the multitudes, they were mad at him because he wasn't doing it again. And folks began to drift away to the point that Jesus himself was so depressed, he turned to his disciples and he said, well, y'all leave him too? I like John when he soars up into heavenly places. I like John when he encapsulates the entire gospel in those eternal words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him should have life. The Gospel of John is written in prose, but it's written in the most beautiful prose of the entire Bible. So much so that even in the English translation, it reads like poetry. It just flows. He goes back to the beginning of the cosmos, the very start of the Gospel, and he sees Christ in the first breath of creation. And he says... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God, and through him all things have come into being. And apart from him, nothing has come into being that has come into being. In him was light, and that light was the light of women and men. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. How can you read that and not feel your heart just <clears throat> soar over the cosmos and say, yeah, God's got this. The prophet Isaiah we read this morning. My heart soars. All native people love Isaiah where he says, even young people are going to get tired and they'll sometimes fall and stumble, but those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. It just stirs my heart to think of mounting up on eagles' wings. At this time of year, 
All creation is shouting glory to God. And, and I feel my heart just stirred every time I look out the window and say, yeah! I just want to join that unending song of creation. But if we are in this glory of October, then Halloween's coming soon, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Roughly a week from now, come to think of it. And as we feel our hearts stirring, we also feel those lengthening shadows, the darkening days. I fully confess to you, uh, my body, my circadian rhythms work on the sun, not on Congress. So this time of year, as I am having to get up in the dark, I find it harder and harder as an old man, and I go through more and more coffee. <laughs> I want strong coffee, and I want it now. It's just harder for me to get stirred and motivated as the shadows lengthen. I don't come to church to hear a depressing message about shadows. If I wanted to be depressed, I'd stay home and watch network news. <laughs> All you got to do to be, and I don't care which news outlet is your favorite and which one you hate the most, it doesn't matter. Turn on any news outlet and pretty soon you'll have plenty of reason to be depressed. Oh, okay. It's all just the wheels are falling off, we're on a grease bobsled, and we're not going to heaven. <laughs> and whatever happened to feel good movies? Have you noticed this? In, in a good story, there's supposed to be this thing called character development. And in character development, you're supposed to find traits in the center of the story of the people that you're rooting for, the people that you admire. You're supposed to watch them unfold as human beings and grow and struggle and triumph. They don't make movies like that anymore. The, the subject of the movie is no more a hero than the villain is. It's just the subject of the movie usually has bigger biceps, bigger guns, better aim, and more complex chicanery. There's nothing to like about the heroes of a movie anymore because they're just as nasty as the villain. I refuse to pay good money go to a movie and get depressed. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly don't want to go to church and, well, okay, I don't pay as much to, for a church service as a good movie these days. Maybe we should start charging for popcorn. Thank you. <laughs> I certainly don't go to church hoping, you know what? When I get done here, I want to leave more depressed than when I started. <laughs> I, I want to hear something to make me feel good. I want to hear something to encourage me, because life is hard, man. I, I want something to lift me up for at least one hour a week. Amen? Amen. Amen. But here's the thing. I firmly believe that the biggest effect of this pandemic we have been through is not viral. It's emotional, it's spiritual, and it's psychological. Millions of people are depressed. Before the pandemic hit, one of the census agencies included a standard uh, induction form in their census question 
Asking people the questions you ask when you're trying to identify somebody who is suffering from clinical depression. And it came back that the majority of Americans are suffering from depression. Since the pandemic, that's gotten way worse. Millions of our fellow Americans are suffering from depression. Millions of our fellow human beings worldwide are as well. The truth is, many of our own church members are suffering from it. Some of our church folks have not come back since we started our in-person meetings. We're grateful that some of you all are joining us online. But some folks have fallen victim to depression, and they feel unable to connect even with worship. So there's a danger when we make our Sunday services, our scriptures, our songs too full of sweetness and light. The danger is that people who are going through that dark night of the soul feel like there's something wrong with them. They feel like they shouldn't feel the way they do feel. And then the church is the last place they can come and talk about it because this is where everybody's happy, right? Right. <laughs> Over the years, I've lost track of how many people have come to me in a moment of confidence and said, Pastor, I, I just don't think I'm a Christian anymore. Said, what? You're, you're one of the best Christians I've ever met. How can you think that? And they confessed to me, well, here lately, I just don't feel like my prayers are connected. I just don't sense God's presence with me. I, I just feel like I'm struggling and I, I'm not sure I'm connected to God anymore. I'm struggling with depression, Pastor, and I know I, I shouldn't feel that way, but I, I just feel like I've lost my way, I've lost my faith in life. I always say to them, just like I say to you and anybody else who's facing those dark shadows, you haven't failed. We have failed. We failed to tell you the truth about what's in the Bible. We failed to tell you the truth about the struggles Jesus himself faced. We failed to tell you the truth that... God walks with you in the darkness, even as he does in the days of light. Jesus himself, on the night in which he was being too betrayed, took bread and blessed it and broke it and said, Take and eat, this is my body given for thee. Likewise, also after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is the cup of salvation for the remission of sin. Do this often in remembrance of me. And then we stop reading. We skip over the part where he went out to the garden that same night, just after he had instituted the Lord's table. And he said, Daddy, I don't want to do this. Daddy, I'm not sure I can do this. <laughs> Daddy, I'm not sure this ultimate sacrifice will do anything good. Is there another way? Can't you open another doorway here? I don't want to go through this. The truth is, if Jesus had none but disciples like me, I can understand him saying, I'm just not sure they'll ever get it, Lord. I'm just not sure it's worth it. We failed to tell our own disciples that there were times when Jesus felt forsaken and looked around at his closest cadre and said, are you all fixing to leave me too? 
<laughs> and we fail to tell the church that the book of Psalms is full of raw prayers of frustration and anger and isolation. We skip over those. Those are not ones we read in church because they seem too raw and angry. I love the feel-good fuzzy songs. I want to walk with the Lord beside the still waters and have him cuddling me like one of his lamb. Oh, the Lord is my good shepherd. I love at this time of year to recite Psalm 121. I lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. I, I love talking about making a joyful noise to the Lord because unlike Mike and Carrie, most of us noise is as good as we can get. <laughs> I love saying, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord together. I don't like psalms like we read this morning. Psalms like Psalm 102, where it talks about feeling my life draining away and saying, Lord, where are you when I need you? But the truth is, if you have never felt isolated and removed, if you've never felt like your prayers were going nowhere, if you've never felt like you were facing a time when God was far from you, if you've never cried out to God, at least in your heart, where are you when I need you? Then I'm here to promise you that day is coming. The rest of us have already been through them. The rest of us have already faced them. And many of the rest of us are in them right now. And sometimes we leave each other the impression that the task in worship is to pretend like everything is fine. Because you don't want to ruin the party for those of us who have got it all together. <coughs> Truth is... None of us have got it all together. Amen? Amen. We're doing the best we can, and we're singing God's praise every step of the way. But sometimes we're doing it in darkness, and we're walking by faith and not by feeling, because all the feeling is gone. We all get depressed from time to time. Depressed is kind of a term for a profound sadness, sometimes a sense of lethargy. But most of us, at some time or another, also face this thing called clinical depression. Clinical depression doesn't mean that you feel sad. Clinical depression means that you feel unable to feel anything. Unable to connect with anybody, and that includes God. Most of us go through a season of clinical depression. Some of us go through years and years of it. And we have left people with the impression that if they face clinical depression either temporarily or on a long-term basis, if they don't fit in with us and our Pollyanna theology, where everything is sugar plums and lollipops. I'm here to tell you all, that ain't the scriptural witness. The scriptural witness is, that there are times for all of us when we go through those seasons of doubt and despair. It's important for us to be honest with each other about that. So you know that the Bible isn't silent about this. If you've never read the book of Psalms, I implore you to do so. And I confess to you as I, I do that, I'm fully aware that the Psalms, primarily a book of poetry, and for some people, poetry just 
leaves them flat. There are other scriptures that speak to this, but none quite so well as Psalms. So if the Psalms speak to you at all, read the whole thing. Not just the happy, happy, joy, joy Psalms. Not just the Ren and Stimpy Psalms. Read them all. And don't skip over the ones that are angry and frustrated and dark. Some of these psalms that are dark have a sudden shift in mood, and they go, and God heard me and answered me, and everything turned out fine. If you're going through a time of darkness, I encourage you, I implore you, I give you permission to take a pencil at least, maybe even a pen, maybe even a, I hesitate to use such strong words in church, Sharpie marker. <laughs> and draw a line between the angry and isolated parts that speak to your heart right now. Write a date beside it where that's what you feel. And beside the line, you might work, write the words coming, but not here yet. Later on, you may go back and realize you're in that second part of the psalm. You're in the, the part where you said, and it all worked out. I walked with God through the valley of the shadow. And God worked it out, and everything's great now. Write that date beside there and write the words, prophecy fulfilled. But when you're not ready to cross over that line yet, it's important to know the good news is coming, but it's okay that it's not here yet. The good news is coming, but sometimes it's Good Friday and not Easter. Sometimes, worse yet, it's Holy Thursday and we're praying alone in the garden. It's important for us to be honest about those dark times of faith so that we don't feel like we have to pretend with each other. We don't feel like there's something wrong with us. But it's important for another reason. I know a man who was angry at the church, despised Christians, hated all those preachers, purveyors of this gospel of sweetness and light. And i got to tell you, the happy, happy, joy, joy gospel sells better than honesty. If you go home and turn on any of the mega preachers who are on network TV today, they're making a lot more money than I am. They're selling a lot more books than I am. They're getting a lot more hits on social media than me. So in a democracy, maybe they're right. But I know a guy who despised that kind of Pollyanna theology and thought all Christians were that way, and that's all there was to Jesus. And then one day somebody opened Isaiah 53. And he read through it, and he began to weep. And he literally fell to his knees as he read, and he said, took me years to figure out what happened to me in that moment. But years later, I began to realize it was exactly what happened to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus when the light knocked him from his horse. And he said, Who are you, Lord? He realized in a blinding flash that this Savior of Isaiah 53 was not sugar plums and lollipops. He was a man of constant sorrow, bruised for our iniquities and wounded for our transgressions. He was a man despised. In other words, Jesus was a man who walked life just like us. And in that time of sorrow and despair, Christ brought victory through his suffering and death, and yes, resurrection. But Isaiah 53 
is the most startlingly accurate portrayal of Jesus in all of the Old Testament. And in fact, it may be the most startlingly accurate prophecy in all of Scripture. I know that guy personally. I have heard him speak, and his testimony always moves me to tears. But I've heard from dozens of others through the years who have been moved by this same revelation of a Savior from Isaiah 53. A Savior that's not all bumper stickers and hallmark cards. A Savior that is not all cute little lambs and bunny hymns. A Savior who bleeds who knows sorrow and walks with us through those times. I want you to know that Christ's suffering and death were part of God's plan. And I want you to be sure that you know that the dark days you face are also part of God's plan. God doesn't aim to leave you there. But God does aim to walk with you through that. And it's because we know a Savior where no matter how dark our days get, no matter how many people leave us and forsake us, no matter how many people speak ill against us or use our name as a curse word, no matter how bad it gets, we've got a Savior who's been there ahead of us and knows the way through. God's walking with you in the days of sunshine, in the days when all creation is glorious. God's walking with you in the days of darkness and pain and heartache as well. And it's all part of the plan. It's all headed to the good news at the end. But God loves you even when you can't see the good news at the end. That's all I got, y'all. What's on your heart? Anybody thinking, yeah, amen? Anybody thinking, man, you need to go with the mega preachers. <laughs> go back to sugar plums and lollipops. So I think your message was profound, and it's um, well timed. Uh, because uh, the conversations that I have outside of Sunday um, are exactly what you're talking about um, with many, many people. So I think the relevance of a, uh, uh, a message like this is huge, um, and, and I think it's um, comforting to people to hear. Uh, that's my hope, is that uh, we all... We all need the comfort most when the days are dark. Yeah, Bill. I guess I would, I would suggest that the, the message that, that I take from, from your message is that every day of our life is a prayer. Uh, is that whatever the, the pain, the sorrow, the joy, all that is a prayer to God. And I, I think it's, it, it behooves us all to remember that our daily life is, in fact, a prayer to God. Amen. Thank you for that, Bill. Yes, Virgin. I like your idea to have a piece of paper and a pencil and write down the date on the back of your sorrow, your darkness, your quietness, problems, and suffering. And then, later on, you revisit. Because if you ask prayers for God, you don't get the answer overnight. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you get an answer you don't even know it. Yeah. So sometimes it's nice to revisit that one and put the date. Oh, I don't have all that. On. Oh, I guess the God answered me already. <laughs> <laughs> I like that idea. Yeah. Thank you for that. And look, this is uh, another sermon I'm going to do another time. So this is just a preview of it. <laughs> But I, I learned about this in my very first church on the Mississippi River. I had uh, uh, 
we revoke captors in the church. And it's not the gambling casino kind of uh, paddle boats. I'm talking about the ocean-going barges that are huge. And uh, I asked one of them, how do you navigate something that big? Because I'd spent enough time on the Mississippi River myself to know it's never the same twice. And, and there are hairpin curves, and how do you steer that thing around? And he said, well, I have instruments that look down river ahead of me, or up river ahead of me, or miles. And sometimes I have to start making a turn five miles before I get to the turn. And it struck me, first of all, it's a good Native American sermon because uh, the Holy Spirit is analogous to the eagle in our teaching, and the eagle is the one who seeks far. And sometimes I have found myself trying desperately to knock the wheel out of God's hand and say, no, 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 you need to go over here because I couldn't see as far as God. <laughs> but God was steering for what was down the road. And it's only in retrospect that I look back and go, oh, you did know what you're doing, Lord. Oh, there was an answer there, even when I was fussing about there not being an answer. Chris, I hope you won't mind me telling that uh, Chris felt a, a calling on his life at a time when uh, it was during the George Floyd turmoil, and he answered that calling on his life by becoming a peace officer and carrying God's light into some of the darkest moments of people's lives. So I wonder if you've got a reflection on all of this. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I, I've done that. Um, that the gospel has this uncanny ability to meet people exactly where they are, irrespective of their circumstance or situation. And in this newfound career of mine, um, I often encounter people in very dark times in their life who are on the worst day that they could possibly be having. And so I, I find an opportunity to share the gospel with people who, uh, who I've just recently changed to a hospital bed because they're suicidal or um, or uh, violence or whatever because they don't know how to work out whatever's going on inside of them. Uh, and it's just been uh, incredible to watch to watch the spirit move in moments when you wouldn't otherwise think. Uh, it's an appropriate time to be sharing the gospel. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm sure for the people that I share it with in those moments, it's a little awkward for them at first, too, but the change is profound. You know, when people are walking through a very dark time in their life and um, you share the good news of Jesus with them in a way maybe that they've never heard before and connect it to where they are, it changes the course of where they're going, maybe where their heart is leading them, or where their where their mind is, and not everyone that I, that I meet is uh, is clinical. Um, some of them are just really frustrated with their circumstance, and they don't know what else to do. And so in those moments where you know uh, it it's not just you know counseling plus medicine that's necessary, but where it really just is a condition of the heart, a condition of the spirit. Uh, the gospel moves people uh, and saves. It's just it's been really incredible to, to share it with people who um, who are combative and uh, and they just don't know how to work out what's going on inside of them and to see the change take place or to walk away from a guy who have, who's in the jail after being arrested and tell him I'm going to keep praying for you. You know it, it changes the dynamic of what's going on in them and how they're interacting with the world around them. And it's not me or them, it's just an offer. It's almost like God has a plan, huh? <laughs> and uh, we think we're be a part of that plan. Be in prayer for Chris, because he, he walks in the dark places all the time. Um, and in that time, a lot of times, for a lot of people, we have to get to that dark place before we even open our eyes to see that Christ is in there. Amen. So they have they are 
Absolutely. We're just so so lucky to be here and, and want to hear more of your poetry. But it's not enough. We're going to close with a word of prayer, and I'm going to invite you to be honest to God. Um, you need know, you feel like calling out to God what's on your heart. Uh, we're going to work on making sure that there's no judgment here, and that. We all love each other in the times of shadows. And I'll close with a word of prayer in a moment. Lord Jesus, hear us as we call out to you from the, from the days of light and the days of shadow. Lord, send us forth in peace and power to bear your light into the darkness, even when we don't see the light ourselves. And Lord, give us hope for that day when the light does come again. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Y'all get out of here. <laughs>